Selamat datang. Oi, ni hao. Salam. Hai san. Hello. Hola. Daiga hao. Bem-vindo à City Church. Nós estamos no Northern Quarter. 雖然我哋嚟自世界各地，但係我哋喺基督入面咧都係同心合一嘅。Whoever you are, wherever you're from， 我們都非常歡迎你加入我們的大家庭。Walaupun kita dari berbagai bagai budaya dan latar belakang, mohon sepahan kau yang mukhtalif di hastim, amu dar badan yang pasti dan kenal ham jam shodim. Kristian senaka bina kloko hal ham osleta kloko sa. Nós temos uma palavra centrada no evangelho para os adultos e grupo para as crianças. Sebelum sebis kita juga ada satu sesi rehat untuk menikmati kopi dan kek. Tangan skema obli bedre shan medeg. We hope that you will want to worship. God with us. Well, happy Easter and welcome to City Church online. It is great to know that uh, this afternoon we're joining with numerous people around the world as we gather together to worship our resurrected Saviour. Uh, people have talked about how uh, the coronavirus crisis has changed the world, uh, and it has, hasn't it? Uh, is why we're, we're sitting in our living rooms watching at our computers this afternoon. But you know, there's an event that had an even bigger impact on our world. It, it happened 2,000 years ago where God himself stepped into our world. Uh, the God who flung the stars into space was born in a stable in Bethlehem. Uh, the one who breathed life into the universe, suffocated to death on a cross. But as we remember on Easter Sunday, he, he didn't remain in the grave. The, the tomb was empty as he rose on the third day, victorious over sin and over death. Now, isn't that news that we need to hear today in our world that is mourning the loss of so much life? Isn't that the one we need to look to today? The, the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he dies. And so we're going to start our service today by singing of our great and glorious Saviour as Malk leads us in How Great Thou Art. Then sings my soul, my soul.
My children and I spent last uh, Sunday morning watching the latest instalment of Super Purple Girl and Tales from the Book of Judges. Now, if you haven't had a chance yet to tune in on that, I'd really recommend it. It's absolutely fantastic. I'm guessing that Easter is going to be really different uh, for families this year. Uh, I know for myself, I'm hoping that social distancing is going to give me a distinct advantage in the Easter egg hunt this afternoon. Uh, but to hear more about what families in the church are going to be doing this Easter and about resources that are available to help you this Easter, uh, we're going to listen now to Chloe. Hey, happy Easter. Um, hope you're having a really lovely Sunday with your friends and family. Um, seems like a really strange Easter, this one. It might be different to any that you've experienced before, um, particularly with the beanbag holidays, but actually I'm not really sure what day it is anymore. But it's Sunday today, and I'm really happy that you're here with us. Um, we hope that even though it looks a bit different, you've been managed to have some really good quality time with your families and even kept some of those Easter traditions. But hopefully that we can just reflect on what the true meaning of Easter is and just celebrate the fact that Jesus has risen and has defeated uh, death and is alive. Um, thank you so much for sending in your pictures this week. We've really enjoyed seeing what you're doing. Um, there been some amazing activities and I think your parents are doing such an amazing job and kids, some of the things that you've done have really wowed us. Um, we'll be able to take a look at those in a minute. Um, hope you've enjoyed the Easter activities we've sent out this week. Why not have a go at some more of them tomorrow, today, and the weeks coming up. But please do send in, our in your pictures because we'd love to see them. Hope you have a lovely day, guys. Remember to tune in to Super Purple Girl, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Well, I've really been enjoying my connect group during this time of lockdown. Uh, if you don't know what a connect group is yet, it's eight to ten people uh, who meet midweek either on a Wednesday, Thursday or Friday uh, to chat together about the message they heard on Sunday uh, and to work out how it applies in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, one of the really exciting things over the last couple of weeks has been seeing how lots of people who've never physically attended a service at City Church have been able to get involved with our connect groups midweek. Um, if you'd like to do that, all you need to do is email liam at citychurchmanchester.org. Um, our students have been really enjoying Students Online. Uh, that's an online meeting that takes place at two o'clock in the afternoon every day, uh, where students gather together for, for devotionals, for Bible study, to encourage each other and to support and care for each other at this time. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about that, you can email alan at citychurchmanchester.org. Uh, we're also really keen to provide you with resources to help you at this time uh, and also to help you as you seek to invite others to enjoy Christ for the glory of God. If you've got any ideas at all about things we might put online, uh, please do email me at ralph at citychurchmanchester.org. And if you're wanting to find out more about what programme we're putting on at the moment, uh, you can find out full details on our church website. Uh, finally, if you were with us last week, you'll know that we introduced for the first time our after-service chat. Um, I really enjoyed a good conversation with a bunch of people uh, on my chat over a cup of tea last week, and I'd really encourage you to, to, to do the same if you can. Uh, there'll be a link coming up on Facebook Live uh, straight after we finish this service. Well, well at this time of Easter, uh, we're reminded about a number of things. We're reminded about the, the amazing life that the Lord Jesus has brought through his resurrection. But we're also reminded of the darkness of our sin. I, I don't know about you, but 
But I feel like the lockdown has really exposed the sin in my heart in lots of ways. Uh, the, the stresses and strains of what's been going on, uh, combined with the tiredness, uh, combined with the, the strains of living in such close proximity, uh, has brought out some of my deep-seated sins and, and brought them into view. And the appropriate place to bring those sins, of course, is the cross of Christ. So, so I'm going to do that now for, for all of us. I'm going to lead us in praying a prayer of confession. It is taken from a collection of Puritan prayers called the Valley of Vision, uh, and I've adapted it for us to use today. So let us bow our heads and let us come before the Lord to confess our sin. O oh God of grace, you have put my sin on my substitute and have counted his righteousness to my soul, clothing me with a bridegroom's robe, a robe of holiness. But in my walk, my daily living, I am still in rags. I have no robe to cover my sins, no loom to weave my own righteousness. I am always standing clothed in filthy garments, and by grace alone do I receive a change of clothes. For you justify the ungodly. I am always going into the far country and always returning home as a prodigal, always saying, Father, forgive me. And you are always bringing forth the best robe. Every morning, let me wear it. Every evening, return in it. Go out to the day's work in it. Be married in it. Be found in death in it. Stand before the throne in it, enter heaven in it, shining as the sun. Grant me never to lose sight of the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the exceeding righteousness of salvation, the exceeding glory of Christ, the exceeding beauty of holiness, the exceeding wonder of grace. Amen. I'm now going to lead us in praying for our church, our city and our leaders. So let's pray again. Father God, thank you that you are Lord over all. As we heard last week, Lord Jesus, you you are the king who has come and you are the king who sits on the throne. Father God, we pray for us as a church uh, as we endure the suffering of not being able to gather together in person as we deal with all the stresses and strains of lockdown, as we come to the terms with with our situation, Lord, would you give us much grace? Would we shine as lights as we hold out the gospel in our homes, with our families, with our friends online? Would you help us to be those who do not fear, but put our trust in the God who is mighty to save, and the God who is good and sufficient in life, and in death. Lord, help us to make the most of all the opportunities you give us and help us to live in a way that honours you and blesses others, we pray. Uh, Father God, we pray for our city of Manchester. Uh, We pray for the city leaders as they seek to to care for us and look after us. We pray for the police as they seek to, uh, to enforce the lockdown in appropriate ways. And we pray for the medical staff who who are working in our hospitals and GP surgeries and pharmacies. Lord, would you be with them? Would you strengthen them? Would you give them endurance, we pray. And Lord, we pray for our government at this hard time as they seek to govern. We pray for our Prime Minister uh, that he would be restored to health. And we pray for those who lead with him. Would you give them great wisdom and discernment? Would you help them to govern knowing that you are the one to whom they are ultimately answerable, and you are the one who will give them the strength to lead with all justice and righteousness. Uh, Lord, we pray these prayers at a time of great national and indeed world sadness, but we know that we pray to the God who has conquered death. We know we pray to the Saviour who has promised that he will return And that on that day, we read in 1 Corinthians, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. 
For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up by victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? But thanks be to God, he has given us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Malchus is going to lead us in another song now. It's a song uh, that reminds us of our needs. And prayer, prayer is all about need, isn't it? As we prayed a prayer of confession, we remembered our need for forgiveness. As we prayed for others, we remembered that we're not in control of our lives. And in this song, we're going to declare, Lord, Lord, I need you. Uh, as Mount plays, uh, maybe you want to just quietly reflect in your heart. Uh, maybe you want to sing along, uh, or maybe you want to ask us to, to pray for you in a week. If you want to do that, there's a link that's going to come up on the screen, prayer at citychurchmanchester.org. Y- you can send your prayer requests in there, uh, and we will commit to praying for you as a staff team in a week. Lord, I come. I confess, bowing here, I'll find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need The reading this afternoon is from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. Listen to the word of the Lord. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. 
They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hand of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. And now Matt is going to come and preach that passage for us. I always feel that coming into the new year or a new term feels like walking through a new door of life. And I guess the new year, it feels like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? Well, some of us have dared to imagine the future where we step out through the doors of our homes once the storm of the virus has passed. And we wonder what type of new world we're gonna step out into. In the future, we know that there is a door to a new life waiting for each one of us. The problem is, it probably won't be the new life that we want. Now, some of us hear that and sigh. Why is it always the doors we want to go through are always the ones that are locked to us? I wonder what that is in your life. What door or opportunity that if you should not get through it or achieve it, would be the worst thing in the world. Well, that's why I think this pandemic, which brings such a continual thread of death, hanging over, I guess, the vulnerable in our nation, is so distressing for us. It's because it feels so grossly unfair, doesn't it, that death should stop some of us from achieving our full potential, or stop us loving to the best of our ability, or stop us passing through the door to the life that we've always longed for. And it's for that reason, stories that focus on the theme of rebirth, I think really resonate with us. Now, rebirth stories at one level are similar to coming of age or or finding yourself stories where the lead character goes through a time of hardship, often failure, only to have learned something crucial about who they truly are and they, they come out of the other side stronger than before. And with all the positive optimism of a new life ahead of them. A classic example of this is The Shawshank Redemption. It's it's one of my favourite films. And it's the story of a banker convicted of of a double murder, a guy called Andy Dufresne. And he's innocent of the crime that he's accused of, but he finds himself in a prison, surviving 19 years of harsh prison life all the while creating an unlikely friendship with fellow convict Ellis Red Redding, played by the actor Morgan Freeman. Now, spoiler alert, I don't feel bad about it because the film's been out over 20 years, but the film climaxes when Andy Dufresne finally uh, escapes, not through a door, uh, but through a tunnel that he's been digging for years. Now, stories of rebirth are fundamentally stories of hope, which is why we love them. And Red, in the film, says this once he's escaped, I find that I can barely sit still or contain the excitement that only a free man can feel. I'm at the start of a long journey whose conclusion is certain, and I hope I can make it across the border. 
I hope to see my friend and then shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it's been in my dreams. I hope. But you know, although we love this idea that we can start over and, and things will be different, better, what really is the basis for that belief? After all, the author Tim Keller writes, if the evolutionary mechanism for natural selection depends on death, destruction and violence of the strong against the weak, well then these things are perfectly natural. On what basis then does the atheist judge the natural world to be horribly wrong, unfair and unjust? Well, they're provocative words, aren't they? When a loved one dies, we find great comfort in thinking that they're somewhere better. Or perhaps a room next door to the one we're in where all things are good, but what evidence do we really have that that room exists? Well, that brings us to Luke 24. Jesus is declared dead by a number of reliable witnesses and is placed in a tomb, which is a, a large cave. And a huge rock, the size of a small bus, was, was rolled over the entrance and a seal of the Roman Empire was placed over it that said, death to anyone who would break the seal. And a company of guards was placed outside the tomb, all to make sure that no enthusiastic religious fanatics would steal the body. Yet the eyewitness account reports that three days later, the door was open, the soldiers are fled, and the body is gone. Now, one of the most perturbing details for anyone wishing to discredit the claims of Jesus' resurrection is that the first eyewitnesses on the scene were women. Now remarkably, Luke devotes verse 10 to being a precise register of who those women were. Women who the society of the time would not even consider to be reliable evidence of anything. And yet Luke states that the same women who witnessed him die were the same women who witnessed the empty tomb. Therefore, if you were going to fake Jesus' resurrection, you would not have your primary witnesses being women. Unless, of course, that is actually what happened. See, does that mean the door is open? Maybe. But the door open to what? Well, come with me to verse 6. The witnesses describe seeing two men dressed in white. And in Matthew's Gospel, these witnesses are identified as angels, literally messengers from God. And the messenger says, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Well, that message that we have in our passage today has three parts. And the first part is this, Jesus is alive. Now, I remember when I was looking into these claims of Jesus' resurrection, uh, and my reflex response all those years ago was, well, th th this is impossible. I don't know what they saw, but their conclusion is obviously wrong. And weren't people so much more gullible in the past? Now, I thought that until it was shown that the Jews actually had no category of God dying or coming back to life. You see, if you were going to make up a rumour, you would claim that Jesus never really died. But that's not what they, they do here, is it? They're very clear that he's dead, but then he rises again. After all, who's ever heard of a dead God? Secondly, in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul, when making the case of Jesus' resurrection, cites over 500 people who saw the risen Jesus. Now, that's a crowd of witnesses big enough to refute any fake news. Think about it like this. If you lived 2,000 years ago, it would take you the best part of 18 months to speak to all the witnesses to Jesus being alive from the dead, if you determinedly spoke to one a day. You know, when I, uh, when I wander through old houses, I, I have a taste for an adventure because I like to tap on the walls, imagining that I might find a false wall hiding a secret tunnel or, or there's a hidden door. I say that to you 
Because if you want to talk about the plausibility of the resurrection, then you have no choice but to find yourself in the unfamiliar territory of accepting that behind death, there is a false wall, the possibility of an opening, a door to a new life. And Jesus is the only credible example in history of a man who found a way through that door. Now, much has been said, hasn't it, about the fact that we feel an overwhelming sense of vulnerability, that we feel about present times right now or even of our future. We're told our fragility may last weeks or months, even a year or more, but all we know for definite is that things will never return to the old normal because we can't unsee our vulnerability. We can't unsee or unremember the fact that the things that once promised us security and happiness, money, career, relationships even, actually offered us no deep peace when the lockdown crashed upon us. We know that this year might be the year that the virus turns our world upside down. But we also know perhaps in a few years down the line, there'll be something else. And then there'll be something else again. The writer Francesca Melandri, in an article in The Guardian, telling Brits what we can learn from the Italian experience of COVID-19, she finished her prediction with this. We can only tell you this, that when all of this is over, the world won't be the same. We can't go back to blissful ignorance. Instead, we're left with a, a longing stronger than ever for another world, an alternative life that is truly, truly safe. C.S. Lewis, the great storyteller, uh, says this, at present, we are on the outside of the world, the wrong side of the door. We discern the freshness and purity of the morning, but they do not make us fresh and pure. We cannot mingle with the splendors we see, but all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. In other words, what Lewis is saying is our suspicion that there is another room, a place to start again, is real. And the door is to be found here in the tomb on that very first Easter day. Now that's the first part of the message that Jesus is alive, but the second part of the message from the angels is no less remarkable, and it's this. The plan was always to bring healing through pain. I don't know if you know, but one of the longest medical operations that you can have is brain surgery. And it's so long because it's so complicated and it's so difficult. Well, what would it take to heal the world? from what the Bible calls sin, that is, all the ravages of the, the consequences of turning our back against God and the way he's asked us to live. Well, Easter tells us it took three days. And just like uh, a blood transfusion or the most serious of illnesses that require an exchange of an unhealthy organ for someone else's healthy organ, our world being healed of sin, our lives healed of sin, required the exchange of the life of the creator of the world for our lives. And that's what this passage is talking about, the fact that Jesus had to die and be raised again. And just as brain surgery takes huge amounts of preparation and planning to heal the world of sin was a plan that was started long before the beginning of the world. But the plan was always to bring healing through pain. And that means something for us today. You see, if you're a Christian, it means that coursing through you is the life of Christ just as you see him abounding with life, risen from the dead, as you can read in the scriptures, so you too have a spiritual vitality so powerful that even death, when it comes to you, will be as passing through a shadow into eternal life. But if that's true, why does the Christian not feel very different to anyone else? Why do they still suffer? Why do they still bleed or, or get sick or feel so weak? Look, I... I wonder if you've ever met anyone who's just had a life-saving operation. And the operation was a, a total success, but you, you meet your friend and they're, they're still bed-bound. The operation worked, but, but they still look so frail and weak. The trajectory is full health and recovery in the future, but in the immediate, 
while they appear as, as broken as before, yet beneath the surface, everything is different. As a believer, we're not exempt from the suffering of this life. But because the risen Christ has shared his life with us, we follow his pattern of healing through pain. And that means no suffering is ever wasted for the Christian. In fact, our new spiritually healed selves, forgiven of sin, gifted the very righteousness of Christ, means that the pain we feel now contributes to our full recovery. It makes us more like Jesus. For the Christian, though, we still feel fragile and cracked, but we will one day dance like we've never danced, and we will one day sing like we've never sung, and we will one day live as fully as we've always longed to. For that is the pattern of God's plan at Easter, healing through pain. Now, I don't know what pain you're going through right now, but I hope that the resurrection of Jesus is an encouragement for you to persevere. Finally, the message of the angels demands a response. And that's our, our third and final point. There are two responses. You see, it seems that just as Jesus said, the door is open, that there is a way to the other side, to the life that we always had a hunch was out there, well, in verses 9 to 12, the focus switches to a single penetrating question that if the door really is open and the king of the world really has made a way through death to eternal life, well, what then will you do? Well, the women hurry back to the 11 disciples. They tell them everything that's happened, just as I'm telling you today. And we see these two responses. And the first response is right there in verse 11. The disciples hear exactly what you have heard today, and we're told that they dismiss it as a fictional story, a fairy tale, a wishful imagination. Now that response, I think, is simultaneously the easiest response to make and the most difficult, actually, to be logically satisfied with. What do I mean? Well, look, the quickest way to deal with uncomfortable information is to say that really it isn't true. That according to your experience of life, you've never seen such a thing and so you conclude that it's not possible and you remain unchanged. You plough on with life. But the cost of that call is that you have to ignore all the inconvenient details. You know, you have to ignore a whole series of marginalised voices that all have to be hushed up. You have to bury the voices of the, the named women in the account. You have to silence the predictions of Jesus, a man who historians would agree was the victim of a show trial and who predicted his death three times in Luke's Gospel. You have to turn down the volume of the men and women throughout history who even today were dragged from their homes for refusing to deny that Jesus is alive. That's the first response. But the second response to the resurrection, I think, is actually more nuanced. Look, look with me here. Peter hears what the women say and he runs. Now, look, running in the ancient Near East was either for children or for people in fear of their lives. And Peter receives the information that you and I have just heard, and he runs. He's absolutely desperate to see for himself if this is true. Could it be that the door from death to life is, is truly open and Jesus really is alive? Now, the response of running towards Jesus is actually the hardest thing to do, but it actually makes the most sense. I had a, a friend at primary school and he came round to play and he brought his fossils with them and by accident I knocked them out of his hand and they smashed in a pile of dust on the floor and his dad was a police officer and I was afraid that with my guilt weighing over me that his dad would come and arrest me. Well, Peter had an even greater guilt. You see, when Jesus was betrayed and in his time of need, Peter... Peter denied that he had anything to do with Jesus. When Jesus was bleeding and naked on a cross, being publicly mocked, Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, was hiding, caring not for Jesus, but just for himself. You see, wouldn't it be easier for, for Peter to keep hiding? If Jesus really was alive from the dead, if Jesus really was back, 
Shouldn't Peter just have panicked and run further away? But the surprise is, we're told that he doesn't. You see, weighed down by guilt, shame, the burden of his own crimes and the betrayal against God, against his very friend, we're told that Peter actually runs towards ground zero. He runs towards the tomb. Now, of course, at a rational level, Peter's response makes total sense. You see, if you have a broken relationship with God and he's alive, well, the most logical thing that you can do is make peace with him as quickly as possible. And that is advice is as true for you as it was for Peter. You see, if you're not right with God, the only thing to do is find a way to make peace with him as soon as possible. But what gave Peter the courage not to hide from God, but to run towards him as we read in this passage? Do you know, I, I think it was the fact that Peter knew that if Jesus was full of love and grace before he died, it meant that his totally consistent saviour would be equally full of grace and peace and love now that he was alive again. The Puritan writer Thomas Goodwin argues that in Christ's resurrection appearances, because he had dealt with the sin of his disciples on the cross, Goodwin says this, no sin of theirs troubled him but their unbelief. Goodwin went on to say, your sins move God to pity more than anger, and his pity is increased the more towards you just as the heart of a father is to a child that has some loathsome disease. God's hatred shall all fall only upon the sin. Aren't they comforting words? Well, here's how they apply to us. You and I know that our lives are an Amazon warehouse-sized library of things that we have done that express our rejection of God and the way that he's called us to love him and live for him. Some of you know this only too well, and you want to come back to him, but you're afraid that he will not have you back. But here's the thing. You now know as much as the disciples about the events of that very first Easter morning. And you stand now at a crossroads. Two responses. Will you dismiss this as a fairy tale and assume the door to God is locked and the life you were made for is unavailable to you? Or, or will you accept that the door we long hoped existed is now open and Jesus, full of love and mercy, beckons us to run to him and to receive forgiveness and life in full? I think both our heads and our hearts commend us to run to him, for he is not angry with you. He longs to comfort you. You see, we're told that Peter saw the empty tomb and he was amazed and confused. But all the gospel accounts describe how when Jesus rose from the dead, he again met with his disciples, eating with them, enjoying them, restoring their friendship with him. Well, that too, that relationship, that invitation is now offered to you. You see, wherever you're watching this, wherever you're sitting, will you just ignore the, the truth of the resurrection. Pretend the door is shut and, and walk away, or, as Peter has done, will you run towards the open door and the one who opened it, who is alive, waiting, longing for you to run to him? The resurrection is true. So then what will you do with that today? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that Jesus didn't stay dead, but he rose from the grave. And that means all of us who trust in him can be forgiven and know that eternal life is ours. That we can be forgiven of our sin and that a relationship, a permanent relationship with the Lord Jesus is open and available to us no matter what we've done. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give warm assurance to our hearts, those who are struggling. And I pray for those of us who are watching, who have never yet put their trust in you, then today they would run towards you, 
hearing the news of the open door, they would accept the invitation to come and make peace with you, their God. Amen. We're going to sing another song now, and it's an opportunity to rejoice at the truth of the resurrection. It's an opportunity to pray. It's an opportunity to respond. Malik's going to play, and the words are going to be on the screen. But can I invite you to take this opportunity to respond to what you've heard? Jesus went and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down. In Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still. That's the end of the formal part of our service, uh, but we'd love for you to stick around for our after-service chat. Uh, it's a chance for you to meet new people uh, and to speak about some of the things that we've been hearing about as Matt has opened up Luke chapter 24 for us. But as we close, remember what we've heard. The door to the life we long for has been opened. Will you heed Jesus' command to come through it this Easter? Thanks so much for joining us and we look forward to being with you again next week. To cast my mind to Calvary where 
where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior. drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone oh praise the name of the for 